question and I must say that uh, it's a great pleasure and a great honor for me to present here. And today I'm going to tell you something about the computational genetics of honeybee breeding. And I think I may assume that many of you are experts in computational genetics and probably also in breeding, but maybe not so not, not so much in honeybees. So I want to go over some of the basics first. Traditionally, honeybees are bred for four classical breeding goals. These are, of course, honey yield. The beekeepers want to harvest as much honey as possible. Gentleness, meaning a reduced aggression towards humans. Calmness, so that as can be seen on the picture, the honeybees remain calmly on the frames during inspections and do not fly around wildly. And a low swarming drive, so that this, what can be seen on the picture, does not happen, that a swarm forms and leaves the hive that then needs to be caught by the beekeeper. And in addition to these four classical traits, in the last decades, a number of Varroa traits have come. The Varroa milt is a bee parasite, and there are many efforts to breed honeybees that are tolerant or resistant against this parasite. And now if one is interested in the computational genetics of honeybee breeding, of course, one has to somehow model the reproduction biology of honeybees. And this comes with a number of challenges because the honeybees reproduction biology is quite different from other farm animals. So a honeybee colony consists of a queen and several thousands of her daughters, the so-called worker bees. In addition, the queen also has sons. These are the drones. If a daughter of the queen is fed a specific diet, the so-called royal jelly in the larval stage, it will develop not into a worker, but into a daughter queen. And once such a new queen is produced, shortly after hatching, she will leave the hive and mate in midair with several drones from neighboring colonies. After she has mated with uh, sufficiently many drones, she will return back to her hive. And the sperm that she has collected during this ma mating flight is then stored inside the queen in her spermatica, and she uses it for the rest of her life to fertilize eggs from which then her own daughters develop. She, of course, also starts producing drones, but these drones develop from unfertilized eggs. So the drones do not have a father in that sense. And this is already the first challenge for the quantitative genetics. Drones are haploid. So they only have one set of chromosomes from the queen, whereas Queens and workers are diploid. They have the double set of chromosomes. So one has to model this haplodiploid genetics of the honeybee. But to model this is actually not so difficult because there is a correspondence in humans or other mammals, namely the inheritance of the X chromosome. Because there it's also the case that male individuals have only one X chromosome whereas female individuals have the double X chromosome. And the quantitative genetics of X chromosomal inheritance is very well studied for many decades already. The next challenge one has to um, face when describing honeybee breeding in terms of quantitative genetics is that most breeding traits are not done by the queen alone or by the workers alone but they are a shared effort uh, between queen and her worker group. So for example, in honey yields, of course it's the workers who collect the nectar and therefore contribute to the honey yield. But the queen by her egg laying frequency can determine how many workers there are in the colony. And of course, the more workers there are, the more honey can be produced. But this system of a shared performance corresponds in other farm animals 
to maternal and direct effects. So if we, for example, take uh, the weaning weight in piglets, then that weaning weight, of course, depends on the growing ability of the piglet itself, but also on the feeding ability of the sow. Another challenge is that workers are not, the worker group is not one individual with one set of genetics, but they are a collective of several thousands in, of individuals, with each one of them having an independent genetic setup. And how to model this appropriately was solved by Pim Braskamp and Peter Beimer in 2014, and they introduced the notion of average genetics for the worker group. So the worker group is still seen as one entity, and the genetics of this entity is declared to be the average of the genetics of all the individual workers, and this works quite well. And then this whole mating flight, of course, is a big problem in modeling. And it actually poses several problems at the same time. First of all, um, when modeling it, one has to somehow capture the character of a singular multiple mating. Now, this sounds like a contradiction in itself, but the mating of the honeybee queen is singular in the meaning that she only mates once at the beginning of her life, but it is multiple in the, in the sense that she mates with several drones. And this does not really have a correspondent in other farm animals. But the mating flight also comes with very practical problems for breeding. So for example, if the queen just mates with any drones of neighboring hives, it is not clear if and how it is possible to select for drones with good genes. And even worse, if in that area, there are several subspecies of honeybees present, it is not clear how we can avoid hybridization so that a honeybee queen mates with drones from other subspecies, which we do not want. And then an integral part of um, breeding for general farm animals are pedigrees because we have to keep track of the relationships of the inbreeding. And we also need pedigrees for the breeding value estimation. So with the queen just mating with any drones, and one cannot really observe where they came from, what the honeybee can look like. And then lastly, one can make measures to influence this mating process. But for that, one only has a short time frame because the honeybee queen has to mate within the first couple of weeks, so maybe two weeks after she has been hatching. So all of this has to be tackled. And one has done this in the past and still does it as follows. So as I described, the natural situation is that a virgin queen flies during her mating flight to a natural drone congregation area where several drones are, and there she just mates with any of the drones. And we do not know if these drones have good or bad genetic qualities, if they belong to the right subspecies. And after the queen has mated, we also do not know where the exact drones came from that that honeybee queen mated with. And to overcome this problem, one developed um, isolated mating stations. This means that one went to a geographically secluded area, like a deep valley or an island, and there one set up a number of colonies for drone production. And one made sure that in that geographically isolated area, these queens for drone production and their colonies are the only colonies around. Therefore, um, one knows that the drones that are produced by these queens for drone production are the only drones in that area. And so um, a virgin queen is then brought to that isolated mating station for her mating flight. 
And so one knows all the drones that the queen mated with are necessarily from these colonies once set up there. And so by choosing colonies from the right subspecies, one can make sure that no hybridization occurs. And then also typically these uh, drone producing queens are not just any queens, but they are chosen typically as a sister group. So they all share the same mother, the same dam. And this dam can be chosen for her superior genetics. And in this way, at least indirectly, one also enables a selection for drones. So by choosing the paternal grand dam with good genes, one knows that also with a high probability, only drones with good genetics are present at the mating station. So this solves the problems, at least to a certain degree of um, hybridization and uh, drone selection, but how do pedigrees look like? Now, if we have a queen that mated on a mating station and that queen eventually produces a daughter, then we know that this daughter comes from one of the drones of this mating station, but we cannot tell which drone it was. And therefore, one came up with the idea of simply declaring the whole mating station as the sire of that daughter. We also call that a pseudo-sire. So we simply say the sire of the daughter, which drone it is, we cannot tell. We simply say it's the whole mating station. And one can already see here, in this way, we end up with something that looks like a pedigree. And actually, one can also calculate relationships with such pedigrees. And because this is a seminar on computational genetics, I want to go a bit deeper into how such relationships can actually be computed. So let's assume we have two siblings, two daughters of the same mated queen. And now we are interested in the relationship between those two daughters. And we cannot really um, calculate the exact relationship, but we can calculate something that is an expected relationship between these two daughters. And this is as follows. This goes as follows. First of all, with a certain probability, we call it P1, these two daughters come from the exact same drone on the mating station. And in this case, we call them super sisters because as drones are haploid, they pass on their entire genetic information to their daughters. So these two daughters from the father's side have the exact same genes and only from the mother's side, there's some possible differences. So unlike two siblings in mammals or other, uh, yeah, in mammals or chicken, their relationship is not only one half, but it is three quarters. So with probability P1, the relationship between these two daughters is three quarters. The next possibility with probability P2 is that the two daughters come from different drones, but the same drone producing queen. And then their relationship can be calculated as follows. The drones are haploid and give away all their genetic information. This is why they're often seen or described as simply flying gametes. So we have the situation that these two daughters on the father's side just come from two different gametes from the same individual. So also on the father's side, it is just the same as one would have in human or other mammals uh, siblings. So their relationship is one half with probability P2. And lastly, with the remaining probability, the two daughters come from different drones from different drone producing queens. And in that case, if the drone producing queens were unrelated, these two daughters would simply be maternal half siblings with a relationship of a quarter. But because the drone producing queens are generally related, one has to add a quarter of the average relationship between the drone producing queens, DPQs. So this is how the relationship between two daughters of the same queen is in general calculated. But now, of course, one still has to fill the variables P1, P2, 
and RTPQ with actual numbers. So for P1, the probability that two daughters come from actually the same drone, one typically assumes that this is just one over the number of drones that the queen mated with. And there's a study indicating that queen on average mates with 12 drones. So often P1 is simply assumed to be one over 12. Regarding P2, one can also make such combinatorical assumptions, but they are way more involved and they, um, they are also the number of drone producing queens on the mating station plays a role. And actually in the literature, there are several um, recommendations how this should be calculated. And I do not really want to go into these details. Instead, I still talk a bit about the relationship between the drone producing queens. And this actually depends on the history of the breeding program. In particular, if that paternal granddam here um, herself already went on then the drone less related when she herself went on mating station, in which case one has to go even one step further and look um, how the drone producing queens on that mating stations are related to one another. So there are st still some flexibility, what one can put in there for the numbers. And in the literature, different people add different numbers there. But in general, one always ends up with a relationship that lies somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4, provided that neither of the involved queens is inbred and that also the mated queen and the um, drone producing queens here on the father's side are not related. So in general, in honeybees, siblings are less related than in other farm animals. And the whole theory of these um, honeybee pedigrees developed in several steps. First of all, in the late 1980s, Kaspar Bienefeld came up with the idea of the pseudosire and that notion. But the um, probabilistic method of calculating relationships, as I just showed it now, goes back to Pim Braskamp and Peter Beimer in 2014. And in 2018, Richard Bernstein wrote a program that enables a fast calculation of all relationships in a population and also of the inverted relationship matrix and therefore made this whole theory applicable for large populations of honeybees. So with all that, all the challenges of reproduction biology and its description in terms of quantitative genetics are basically solved. And this I used to write a computer program that um, does a stochastic simulation of honeybee breeding. This program is called BSIM and I published it in 2019, still under my birth name, Plata. So what I wanted to achieve with this program was to find sustainable breeding strategies for honeybees. So when we do honeybee breeding, of course, we are interested in an intense selection um, that enables fast genetic improvement. But if we select too sharply, we will run into problems in the long term, meaning that the inbreeding will increase and that we will lose genetic variants in the population. So somehow an optimum between selection intensity, um, enabling fast genetic improvement has to be found. And on the other hand, uh, inbreeding and genetic variants have to be um, kept under control. In honeybee breeding, one generally has uh, two possibilities to adjust the breeding program um, to find an optimum. And on the maternal path, one can influence the selection intensity by the sister group size. So how many offspring a selected queen should have. And the higher the number is, the higher the selection intensity. Because if I keep my population at a constant size, then 
a large sister group size means that I only have to select few queens to maintain the um, population size. And selecting few queens means that I can select with a high intensity. On the paternal path, I can make adjustments by the number of mating stations, because the higher the number of mating stations is, the more of these paternal grand dams I need. And in consequence, the lower is the selection intensity for these paternal grand dams. So on these two, um, with these two possibilities to adjust, I find an optimum and where that optimum is depends on several influences. Of course, the population size will play a role in a larger population for sure. I can do a sharper selection than in a small population, but also um, also properties of the trait of the selection trait play a role, namely the heritability and the number of, qu uh, of quantitative trait loci that determine the trait. And of course, it depends on the breeding goal, what I want to achieve with my breeding program. If I only want a short term boost for my population, maybe for marketing reasons, or if I want to develop a long term sustainable breeding program, which was actually my goal. And so I used my simulation program. And first of all, I looked at 12 different base settings consisting of three different population sizes of 200, 500, or 1,000 queens per year, two different sets of genetic parameters that were, amongst others, um, determined by different genetic correlations between the queen and the worker effects. They are typically negative, and I chose a medium and a strong negative correlation as alternatives. And I also choose two different numbers of QTL to determine the trait. So in total, I ended up with two times two times three equals 12 different base settings. And for each of these base settings, I tried out 100 different breeding strategies consisting of 10 different sister group sizes between one and 10, and 10 different numbers of mating stations that were defined relative to the population size by one, two, three, up to 10%. And all these 100 breeding strategies for all 12 base settings, I simulated for 100 years and then looked at the results. And this has also been published in the journal Insects in 2020. And this is what I found out. So first of all, I looked at the genetic progress after 100 years. And this is shown in this uh, box plot chart. So each of the 12 box plots that can be seen here um, belongs to one of the 12 different base settings. And an individual box plot then spans over the 100 different breeding strategies, the 100 combinations of sister group size and mating station number. And what can be seen here is, first of all, that the different base settings uh, led to different results. So, for example, if queen and worker effects are strongly negatively correlated, I will have a lower genetic progress after 100 years. And also, if the population size is larger, I will also get a higher genetic progress than in smaller populations. But looking at the individual box plots, I can also clearly see that some breeding strategies worked better than others. And this came as follows. Here I fixed a specific base setting and I look at three different selection strategies and show how the genetic progress developed over the 100 years. And in brown, I have a very intense selection scheme with a sister group size of nine and only five mating stations. And I can see that indeed with the intense selection in the beginning, I get a very high genetic progress. But then over time, as inbreeding accumulates and genetic variance is lost, the curve flattens. And in the end, I cannot get much further genetic progress anymore. Uh, in blue, I have a breeding scheme with a very low intensity, a sister group size of only two and 45 mating stations. And I can see that here 
I can maintain my genetic progress over the whole time. But from the very beginning, it is so low that in the end, I also do not end up with a satisfactory result after 100 years. And finally, in, in red with the medium selection intensity, I have a good genetic progress from the very beginning and can maintain this over the whole 100 years. But of course, only looking at the genetic progress is not enough if we want to talk about sustainability. So I should also look at the inbreeding rate. And this I did here again with the box plots for the different um, base settings. But this time on the y-axis, I show the inbreeding rate, meaning the increase of inbreeding per generation. And here again, I can see that different base settings uh, lead to different results, uh, especially in large populations. I have lower inbreeding rates than in small populations. But I can see that there's a very dramatic difference that is achieved depending on which um, breeding strategy I follow within the 100 combinations of sister group size and mating stations. And finally, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN, the FAO, recommends that in any breeding program, the inbreeding rate should be below 1% or even better below 0.5%. And here I can see that for every population size, it was generally possible to meet these FAO recommendations. But of course, for smaller populations, it was much harder than for the larger populations. Now, if we bring inbreeding and genetic progress together, we can see the following. Here on the x-axis, I show the inbreeding rates. On the y-axis, the genetic progress after 100 years. And each of the dots corresponds to one breeding strategy. And here I can see again um, what I saw earlier already. If I select with a very high intensity, I will end up at a high inbreeding rate. And because the curve has flattened over the time, the genetic progress after 100 years is low. Whereas if I have a low selection intensity, I also have a low inbreeding rate, but uh, again, a, also not a very high genetic progress after 100 years. And the optimum is somewhere in the middle. So for all population sizes and all settings, I saw these inverted U-shaped connections between inbreeding rate and genetic progress after 100 years. But what is nice to see is um, if I look at the red dots, the red square dots for the smallest population, that some of the highest dots, so some of the most successful breeding um, strategies in the long term are actually situated to the left of the 1% line, meaning that they are sustainable um, in the FAO sense. With the green axis in the, in the slightly bigger population, I can already see that it's much easier to find um, breeding strategies that are both successful and sustainable. And with the large population of a thousand queens per year, I should already seriously consider to tackle the stricter 0.5% goal. With all this data, I was able to um, develop general recommendations for breeders. And that is that on the maternal part, depending on the population size, they should um, work with sister group sizes of three to four for very small populations. And then for larger populations, this number can go up five to six for a thousand queens per year. And uh, we have every reason to believe that with even bigger populations, one can work with also bigger sister group sizes. On the paternal path, regarding the number of mating stations, we found that it's basically impossible to have too many mating stations, but that some minimum numbers are recommended. And these are 12 mating stations for the smallest population, and then accordingly more mating stations if also the general population size gets bigger. But here I have to say that these are theoretical numbers. 
And um, in practice, these will be very hard to meet. So if I have a very small breeding program of only 200 colonies per year, I will have a hard time maintaining 12 mating stations. First of all, I would have to find uh, 12 spots, geographic, geographical spots that are suited to establish a mating station there. So like 12 islands or 12 valleys. And then I still need the logistics and the um, maintenance costs to, to have all these mating stations working at the same time. So this is not really realistic in practice. And therefore, um, one should look for mating control alternatives. And the first idea that one might have is to just work with natural mating. So that way, uh, one cannot select on the drone side, but one can still select for the best queens. And one could have the idea that this might be enough for a decent um, genetic progress. However, several simulation studies have shown that this is not a good idea and that the genetic progress under no circumstances will be satisfactory. And often it can even happen that the genetic progress uh, comes to stagnate completely after a few generations, so that then I simply cannot make any more genetic progress with this strategy. Another alternative that sounds more promising is instrumental insemination. So honeybees can be instrumentally inseminated for many decades already. But still, in most countries, it is not done by many breeders. However, from a theoretical point of view, um, it should come with many advantages. And actually, in the next couple of years, I'm working on a project funded by the German Research Foundation that wants to look into these advantages. So the idea is the following. If I mate on a mating station, as I described earlier, from my main population, I select a queen to serve as the paternal grandam. From this queen, I then generate the drone producing queens, who then um, generate the drones that mate with the queen. If I do instrumental insemination, of course, I would have the possibility to simply mimic the situation on a mating station. But instead, I can also go and take the drones directly from only one colony and make sure that a queen is inseminated with drones that all come from one colony. And in this way, I can select more different colonies as um, drone spenders. So I have a greater variety of selected sires. And also because all the drones mating a queen come from the same colony, I get more precise pedigrees. And because I do not have this multiplication step with the drone producing queens in between, I can also shorten the generation interval on the paternal side by one year. And so the studies I do about this are still in an early stage, but first simulation studies show indeed that in many situations, I can create a win-win situation where by instrumental insemination, I can achieve a higher genetic gain and at the same time, a lower inbreeding rate, also in the short term. So this is indeed very promising and I hope that in the next years, I can find out much more about this. And another topic that I'm going to work on is optimum contribution selection. So earlier when I said one can determine the intensity of selection by the number of offspring a selected queen should have, I always assumed that all selected queens produce the same number of queens as offspring. But of course, this is not really necessary. And in other farm animals, Theo Moivisen in the 1990s developed the notion of optimum contribution selection. And there for every individual, male and female, a specific optimum number of offspring is determined so that the genetic progress 
um, for the next generation is maximized, but at the same time, inbreeding level is kept on a certain so if I is to the honeybee, of course, on the male side, I would have the mating stations. And but now, because other farm animals, sorry, uh, I Manu, first sorry, select we, we lost. the- Yeah, yeah, the yeah but I think it was bad huh? for the past few seconds. So if you could just- just okay repeat this slide yeah this slide okay so it... yeah thank you <laughs> okay sorry about that in optimum contribution selection one does not say that each queen uh, that each individual should have the same number of offspring as soon as it's collect uh, selected but um i optimize these individually so for each um male and female individual, I determine how many offspring they should have in order to maximize the expected genetic progress for the next generation, but at the same time, keep the inbreeding under a certain predefined threshold. If I want to do this with honeybees, of course, on the male side, I have the mating stations, and on the female side, I have the queens, but now I have them because in other farm animals, I first select animals that should reproduce and then I mate them. But in honeybees, first the mating comes of queen's life and only later she is selected for reproduction. For example, I say that a queen should have five daughter queens, then necessarily the mating station um, that the queen went to also must have these five offspring. So I have to jointly optimize the number of offspring of queens and mating stations. But what an offspring is, is also then, um, of course, one has to differentiate because having an offspring can mean that the queen serves as a paternal granddam, then the offspring would be a mating station or offspring can mean that the queen has daughter queens. So in, the, in order to transfer optimum contribution selection to the honeybee, some theoretical issues still need to be solved. And this is also part of the research project I'm currently working on. So also there, I hope that in the future, I can uh, report some success on this side. But for now, um, I thank you very much for um, listening to me. I hope I could give you some impression of what computational genetics for honeybee breeding means. And now I hope for a nice discussion and I'm open to any questions, of course. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Manuel. This was a really, really interesting talk and very well explained and very clear. Um, so if there are any questions, please ask them in the chat or I don't know where we can raise the hands or the Zoom. Um, yeah, or you might as well just unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, I have a couple of probably rather practical questions and I would just start until we get some more participation. Um, so, so that I have a wait. Um, when you explained the pedigree at the start, you said that all of the sums or all of the or the, the, the model and the, the different probabilities and so on um, for calculating relationship between um, daughters is basically that the queens are not related or not inbred. How do you know that they are not? I mean, um, are there any pedigree information you can rely on? Are there any genotype information? Or is there any practical? Um, yeah, how is this practical to determine the true relationship or an estimate relationship between the two queens, for example? 
Um, I mean, we have these honeybee pedigrees and as in other pedigrees, one um, can determine by the pedigree then if um, a queen is inbred or if two queens are related. So mm -hmm. if, um, sure. if there's a circle in the pedigree, then the queen is inbred. And um, it is not that we cannot handle this situation. It's just the, um, the formula gets more complicated. So yeah. you would then have uh, yeah, terms that um, correspond to the inbreeding of individuals or to the relationship between uh, the queen and the sire, these terms just come into, into this formula. Yeah. So we, we can handle this and yeah. And so, sorry, and then for the pedigree, you basically know the mated queen and then you have the pseudo sire basically when you have a, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But now, of course, if if that uh, mated queen, theoretically, mm -hmm. it would be possible that this mated queen is also a daughter of this uh, paternal granddam. Yeah. And then, of course, one would have uh, inbred daughters. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, so there's one question. Um, so Jana asks. Um, uh, da, 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 da. In honeybees, the phenotype could be a function of the number of bees. In your simulator, if I understand correctly, the genetic or phenotypic value is the average effect of workers plus the queen effect. How could you account for the number of bees in a simulation of the genetic phenotypic value of the colony? So, um, yeah, so in, in general, for all the genetic part, it is. Uh, in this uh, average genetics that I mentioned for um, worker groups, um, it is for the genetic part implicitly assumed that there are infinitely many workers. And of course that is not true, but there's no it's that's close enough finish. Um, that this, of course, um, it's partly the the number of workers is um, is modeled as a property of um, of the queen effect because, as I said earlier, by by the queen, it is determined how many workers there are. But indeed, in some um, situations uh, where the number of workers is determined by a non-genetic but uh, a physical effect we cannot uh, we cannot uh, show this so well yet in the quantitative genetics so for example in instrumental insemination it is possible to inseminate a queen with um, the semen from only one drone but um, then Typically, such queens build colonies that um, are much weaker than normal colonies, and this is not a genetic effect, but simply a fact that there's that the spermatica is not uh, filled well enough. And these effects we cannot really um, model yet in in the setup as we have it so far. Okay, thank you. And you were lost for a few seconds, but I think. Uh... Sorry. No, no, it wasn't bad. Sorry, I shouldn't have said it properly. Um, um, I have, if I might just quickly jump in, I think because it might fit to this topic. Um, I was just wondering when you talked about um, the, the four phenotypes you're interested in honeybees, um, when it comes to breeding programs, obviously um, you want to have a quite, um, or, or for your estimations and simulations, you want to have quite an accurate phenotype and I can imagine that this is probably more or less or quite easy for for the honey um, years but what about the more behavioral phenotypes like the gentleness and the, the swarm what was it swarm and uh, swarm drive uh, how how easy are those phenotypes measured and how can they be routinely estimated or measured for a colony or yeah. 
So um, in the simulations for simplicity, I just um, make up parameters yeah. Yeah. for some uh, artificial trait. But in practice, of course, honey yield is easy to measure simply by um, measuring how much honey it is. So basically by weighing the frames before and after honey extraction and then taking the difference as honey yield. Um, and the others are um, subjectively rated on a scale from one to four by the breeder. So sometimes it's zero to four. Mm -hmm. So um, the breeder goes to the colonies several times a year and rates how uh, calm the honeybees were, if they um, yeah, did not move at all, if they uh, walked around on the frame or if they flew around. So this gives them different grades and simply uh, similar with gentleness and swarming drive. Okay, okay thank you. But um, yeah, it's, it's not the so, most objective yes. uh, yeah. traits, of course. Um, so there's another question from Robert. Um, he says, nice presentation, Manuel. Um, how strong is the application of genomics, uh, SNP chips, genomic selection, et cetera, and honeybee breeding? Um, yeah, I actually, I um, thought of talking about this, but then decided against it, but I still have um, a slide on this. And uh, so genomic selection, of course, is also in honeybees a big topic. And um, first of all, there are some simulation studies that indicate that uh, it's promising also in honeybees. And um, also published in 2020, we have a suitable SNP chip that can be used to genotype honeybee queens. And we use that SNP chip also to um, genotype 3,000 queens and estimate genomic breeding values um, then in the, in the population. And we found out that actually the predictivity of the genomic breeding values is improved. Um, this is a work by Richard Bernstein, not published yet. So it is on a good way, but there are also still open questions namely when a queen can be genotyped and what's the best mode for non-lethal DNA extraction. And if in the future, it might also be possible to include the genomic data of workers into the um, genomic breeding value estimation. So there is still research ongoing, but it is on a good way, I would say. Okay, thank you. Um, so Gregor asks, um, queen and worker effects are often negatively genetically correlated. What drives this ne negative correlation? Um, they are, of course, one can only speculate a bit. In, in general, it can be seen in many, many um, farm animals that um, direct and maternal effects are typically um, negatively correlated with very few exceptions. And I would assume that it has to um, do with that um, by natural selection, some intermediate behavior is the best. So if a um, honeybee colony is very, very non-aggressive, then it might easily be robbed or might suffer from that. But if it's too aggressive, of course, um, this aggressive defensive behavior also comes at a cost. So it should be somewhere in the middle. And so if the queen um, pushes the workers to um, be more aggressive, um, more docile workers will um, lead to the natural optimum. But that's basically speculation on, on my side. Um. Thank you, Manuel. So we have a question from Jenny. Um, um, thank you for the nice presentation. Is it possible to somehow compensate the high number of mating stations by selecting higher numbers of sister groups on the maternal side? What's the influence of such maneuver on genetic gain and inbreeding? Um, yes, in general, that is possible. So um, 
these recommendations I made here are um, are very rough. So um, if we have um, even if we have fewer mating stations here on the paternal side, and uh, we can to a certain degree outweigh this by going lower with the sister group sizes. But with a sister group size of only one or two, um, we simply do not gain enough um, genetic progress right from the beginning so that then the um, breeding strategy mostly is not, um, not really successful anymore. But to a certain degree, of course, one can outweigh this. So if for some reason one is able to, um, to have much, much more mating stations here, then what one could also work with um, bigger sister group sizes, but uh, typically one does not have so many mating stations. Thank you. Um, there are no more other questions. I have a, um, a last one. Um, I'm not sure why this is specifically your topic because um, you're more talking about the breeding programs. Um, but you briefly mentioned at the start that uh, another trait of interest is the susceptibility to varroa. Um, do you know from literature, is this a promising trait to select for? Because the disease can be quite uh, quite bad. And as far as I remember it from my time at the university, um, it's just an increasing risk to different colonies. Do you know anything about genetic breeding values for, for this trait, basically? Yeah, so in the um, large, um, uh, so in, in Germany or in, in Central Europe, there's one big uh, honeybee breeding program called Bee Breed. And there, um, the varroa traits by now make up 40% uh, of the entire breeding value. And um, it is reported that there is a success. So there are different um, traits that are measured. One, one measures how many dead mites fall so the mite development is measured by measuring how many uh, dead mites just fall out of the um, out of the colony, but also um, it is measured how by a pin test how good the um, workers are in detecting uh, infected brood and then throwing the brood out of the colony, and um, these traits have positive heritabilities and so they can be bred for and they are routinely bred for and people report that some progress is being made but I think we are far from entirely solving the problem of um, the war for the honeybee. Yeah, that's very interesting, thank you. Um, there's one more question from Laura. So she um, writes, thank you for the presentation. Uh, your simulator works mainly with mating stations opposed to natural mating. Whilst this is ideal, it's not possible in many cases. How will your simulation develop in the future to expand to more natural mating circumstances? Um, in fact, the simulation can work with natural mating. And I did these uh, simulations that showed that the breeding progress will not be very good with natural mating. So the, um, the simulation, in fact, can model not natural mating. It can also model, let's say, insecure mating stations so that you go to an area that is not fully isolated and there's only a high chance to mate with the, um, with the drones from that mating station and the remaining chance to mate with uh, some other drones. So. In fact, the um, simulation itself, the program itself is quite flexible in this regard. Of course, the question is then which actual simulation one carries out and, yeah. Okay, um, thank you for answering this last question. As far as I'm concerned, this is the last question. And it's, okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much again, Manuel. This was 
a really, really good and interesting talk, I think, for everyone. Um, and yeah, for everyone else, have a nice rest week and see you at the next CGDG, for which we are going to send the invites closer to the date. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Manuel. Have a good time. <laughs>